Uh, it is my pleasure to bring to you uh, two of YouTube's rising stars uh, with the AI Hardware Show, uh, Ian and Sally. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tom, and uh, thanks for the DAC committees for inviting us. Um, we are kind of journalists, analysts. We don't just do YouTube. I know influencer is a very loaded word these days. But what Sally and I do is we have an online TV show on YouTube called the AI Hardware Show. And we cover AI hardware, IP, silicon, and we kind of wanted to do a version for you today. What we're going to do is start off, let's talk about where the silicon market is, yeah, with a focus on artificial intelligence and machine learning. I'm going to cover a little bit about the legacy hardware that we kind of all know and love, CPU, GPU, uh, FPGA, ASIC. Speak about some of the new, uh, new but old concepts that are currently coming through in startups. So analog, neuromorphic, quantum and optical. There's probably a few more I could add to that list. Um, but for the sake of time, uh, we're being a bit minimal. And the reason why um, machine learning is seeing so, so much efficiency is that we're not dealing in FP64 compute. There is a push for low precision range and accuracy of uh, machine learning models. So I'll go into a little bit of that just to bring everybody up to speed so we know what we're talking about. And then we get into the meat and potatoes of the presentation, our AI hardware show. Um, Sally and I are going to take turns speaking about a number of the AI hardware startups. We uh, meet and greet at shows like this in the Bay Area, Canada, Europe, Asia. I mean, there's plenty of them about. And I'll, we'll speak particularly to some of the investment that's going on. We've got a number of unicorns in this industry making strides, some of which are on the verge of failure, and we'll cover that. And then if there's time at the end, end, we're going to have some Q&A. If there's time. If there's time. So what is the AI hardware show? Uh, this is our title card from our first episode. Uh, it was actually about this time last year I had a brain noodle thinking there are so many AI hardware companies out there, either established companies, the NVIDIAs, the Intels, um, or startups that are you know, coming into the fore that people are starting to pay attention to. My list was in the mid double digits. Uh, I reached out to Sally, and yours is in the <laughs> low triple digits. Yeah, it's a lot. So we decided to put together a TV show. It comes in two parts. We have the main episodes, which are kind of like News 24 style. Spend two minutes talking about each of the different uh, AI chips or AIPs in the market. And you can see a list here in the first episode, Google, NVIDIA, uh, AMD, uh, that sort of thing. These are followed by a 30 minute more long form podcast, which we're, we're where we talk about how we feel about the companies, how we've met with them. Kind of chat slash rant about what's yeah. going on. And, and I know that some of those companies are here in the audience today. So if you want to know what we really think about you, stay tuned for those podcasts. Um, but to introduce ourselves, I'll let, Ali, uh, I'll let um, Sally start. Uh, so I'm with E-Times. Uh, E-Times, I'm sure everybody in the audience reads E-Times, of course. Uh, we're the publication of record for the semiconductor industry. Uh, we have been for 50 years. I haven't been there for the whole 50 years. I uh, started on E-Times about six years ago. I've been reporting on AI chips and the AI chip market for about three years, um, which I think is about as long as anyone. It's the most exciting beat I ever possibly could have been given. I absolutely love it. And if you want to check out what I'm writing about new AI chips, go ahead and check it out on eetimes.com. I've known Sally for a while, and she's never been this excited uh, about her job. Um, so my name is Ian Cutris. I was a semiconductor journalist for a, a website called Anand Tech for over a decade, covering their CPU and semi-beat. I became an analyst a couple of years ago with my own company, More Than More. I work with my clients to help with their marketing, messaging, and direction. My background is fairly technical uh, in chemistry and material science. So I help try and bridge that gap in the companies between a lot of their uh, technical back end and their marketing front end, because there's we constantly hear that there's a need for more engineers in this space, and some of that requires speaking to people in an engineering context. And on top of that, yeah, I am kind of an influencer. I've been running a YouTube channel for three years called Tech Tech Potato. That's twice the tech and some chips. And my, my little logo here is a potato eating a wafer. If you ever see me on social media, you'll see a picture of me taking a bite of a wafer, because that's kind of my shtick. So I, I'm going to start speaking here about legacy hardware. Again, the CPU, GPU stuff we all should know. Bring everybody up to speed in what the latest hardware in these, in these uh, markets are and how they're used for AI. x86, ARM, we should be familiar with these. Uh, I want to go through, through the stack through to um, pure dedicated ASICs just to explain kind of where, where some of this machine learning is going and what these companies are doing. So to start off, big behemoth is, is Intel in the CPU space. 
uh, X86. This is their latest generation product uh, using tiles. They're using advanced packaging to get up to 60 cores in these chips. This is Sapphire Rapid. This is their Xeon platform they launched in the last year. Uh, four tiles, 60 cores. They're now implementing lots of accelerators into those cores to help with things like networking and machine learning, either through vector instructions on top of a bunch of optimized software. The bottom right slide here is Aurora, the big supercomputer that we expect to take number one in the top 500 in November. This is built on Intel with Intel CPUs and Intel GPUs. I'll we'll get into the GPUs in a bit. Um, the supercomputer itself is a couple of years late, but we have now fully finished uh, up to three exaflops of performance we're expecting when that gets announced. Um, Intel has lots of AI hardware. I'll cover some of that in a second. But this is, this is a CPU product um, and you know, a highly competitive consumer product line as well. AMD has been their major competitor through this time. And we all remember the days where AMD wasn't competitive. A few years ago, they launched their new generation architecture called Zen, now on their fourth generation of that architecture. And the big thing that's impressed me with AMD is not only gaining 30% market share from something that was close to zero in enterprise, is that they have taken this chiplet strategy to the extreme, how, we've, how we envisioned chiplets to be, the reuse and recycle of core chiplets between consumer and enterprise products. This is their latest enterprise product called Genoa. We like to name it after uh, Italian cities. But you'll see here in the top left, there are 13 chiplets. That's 12 core chiplets with a centralized I.O. die to minimize latency between the cores. That's the, obviously their high performance enterprise model. Underneath that is a more cost optimized version for the consumer market called Ryzen. But the core chiplets, those little small gold um, rectangles you see, are common between the products. And that's indicative of AMD's portfolio today. They only need to do one design, and they can use it for many. It's small, it yields well, they're a strong partner with TSMC, uh, and I wish more companies had their strategy like this, especially when you've got tens of billions of products to sell. In the pure CPU space, we're also seeing a rise in ARM architecture coming through um, for compute, mixture of HPC and AI. This is Fujitsu's A64FX. It came out a few years ago now, but it is the core compute processor in Fugaku, which used to be the top supercomputer in the world. I think it's now about still three or four, but highly competitive. It's a custom ARM architecture, kind of like Apple with their M1 in, in consumer products. But this one, they've attached a massive vector engine to help with compute and paired it with high bandwidth memory. For this chip and the supercomputer that this chip is in, and a few other smaller computers, were pivotal during the pandemic for doing a lot of the simulation about the spread of COVID-19. Uh, so this is now built in supercomputers, and you can go buy blades from Cray and HPE today uh, with this hardware. There are a few other ARM players that I haven't put in this slide deck. You may have heard of Ampere Computing. They're based here in the Bay Area. They just launched Ampere One. Again, custom ARM architecture, 192 cores. Uh, and there's also uh, NVIDIA with their new Grace CPU. Again, 72 cores of ARM built for HPC, built for AI, and to be paired with their GPU. H100, this is a hopper generation, high-end AI accelerator. And this, if you wanted to buy one today on eBay, costs $40,000. There are companies today that have raised over a billion dollars of funding. I think one recently was 1.2, 1.3. And a billion of that is just to buy GPUs for their large language models, just to train their machine learning models. Uh, but this is leading edge technology. This is 80 billion transistors on that centralized compute die built in TSMC 4 nanometer with HBM memory. And the idea is that NVIDIA is selling these hand over fist. Any wafers that TSMC has free, uh, NVIDIA will buy them today just because they have so many people demanding this hardware for machine learning. NVIDIA's big competitor, big competitor, it's relative here. NVIDIA has 90% of the market in training. But the competitor mainly most talked about is AMD with the MI250X. This is their current generation high performance GPU. Um, where it's really shone actually has been in the supercomputing space. If you look at the top 500, or at least the top 10, most of them now are using this processor. It's using latest generation innovative packaging. Uh, there is a bridge there between the compute dies and the HBM. That's not, a, it's not an in package silicon bridge, it's an above package silicon bridge. Uh, it looks like two GPUs on a single package. To the computer, it looks like two GPUs. There isn't any unified special source here. 
Uh, that's coming in the next generation MI300, which they just announced recently, should be coming to market more at the end of the year, beginning of next. But that's taken, again, the, uh, the chiplet design to the extreme. You, you have CPU chiplets, GPU chiplets, HBM, all in the same package, and depending on the customer, you can mix and match. And that's gonna be competing against NVIDIA's H100. Now, Intel in GPU space is fairly new. Intel hasn't been in GPUs for a while, but they put a lot of money, and they have hired and fired people <laughs> to get this thing out the door. This is Intel's Ponte Vecchio, and it takes packaging to the extreme. This is 47 tiles in 2D and 3, 2.5D and 3D packaging. There are compute tiles, there are uh, stiffening tiles, you have IO tiles, and you have HBM. I don't know how, many, how much these things cost, Intel won't tell me, but it is expensive packaging, and this is what's going in that top uh, supercomputer that we'll find about in November, the Aurora supercomputer. You can buy these in a PCIe card, you can buy them in a blade. They haven't necessarily focused too much on the AI messaging of this product yet until they've actually built that supercomputer. And I'll be honest, they've actually spoken more about inference rather than training for this hardware, but they do aim to be price competitive with the H100. Beyond GPUs is FPGAs, and this is a crowd that knows FPGAs very well. Two main companies, obviously, Xilinx and Altera, now owned by AMD and Intel, respectively. Xilinx's portfolio is around big, complex packaged chips with lots of logic cells. So this is the Vertex, on the top left is the Vertex VU19P that was launched a few years ago. Big boon um, for EDA simulation and modeling. They now do versions with HBM, and they actually launched a new version a couple of weeks ago um, which is even bigger than this, again, using advanced packaging. That's part of their Vertex line. They also announced Versal um, uh, uh, last year, a couple of years ago, deciding that actually most of their customers need a little bit of AI with their FPGA. So they now have hardened AI engines in the silicon. They have hardened ARM cores in the silicon for additional compute. And it turns out people often need IO and memory, so they've hardened some IP in there as well. And they have a whole family of products to deal with that. Competitor? is Altera, now owned by Intel, uh, $15 billion back in 2015. And Altera's main line today is now Agilex. It's taken a while since the acquisition to have a full family of FPGAs from Altera, but the Agilex family comes in Agilex 3, 5, and 7. Again, focuses on the logic cells at the center of the FPGA um, with additional AI uh, you know, assistance and instructions. But Intel's taking packaging to the extreme here. You don't really go out and buy one of these individually. You work with Intel to decide what extra chiplets you want around it. Maybe you want your own custom IP. Maybe you need a transceiver. Maybe you need PCIe. Maybe you need HBM. Maybe you need the upcoming CXL connectivity. Uh, the whole family of Agilex is, is built around this. And since the acquisition, I've been a little disappointed on how Altera has been performing. Um, but now they've actually got a full product portfolio. I'm interested to see where they're going with the marketing and messaging with this. And a lot of those Intel FPGAs actually end up in SmartNICs. What's a SmartNIC? Well, your standard network interface can be as dumb as you like. It just data in, data out. We're seeing a trend today where networking topologies, either in the cloud, data center, um, or localized clusters, need to be smart. So people are now injecting smartness into their network controls. You can talk about compression, decompression, and security but maybe you need to run additional analytics on where your data is going, the routing of that data, and, and ultimately how to optimize, especially in the cloud where every cent, every bit transferred matters. If you can monetize that, that's billions of dollars at the end of the day. Amazon, for example, have their own nitro silicon, which is, again, a similar smart in this context, where they're actually saving lots of money. I, I believe an article went out from Dylan Patel at Semi-Analysis recently, saying that over the lifetime, Amazon has saved $7 billion by having smart networking uh, in, their, in their back end. Another ASIC I wanted to showcase, this is an AI ASIC. They, uh, my background's chemistry, and this is a chemistry ASIC, and I wanted to highlight it just because how optimized dedicated silicon can be. So this is uh, the Anton chip, the third generation chip from DE Shaw Research. DE Shaw Re Research is a research firm of a hedge fund manager. He made his money, he was a professor, and he wanted to build his own chip to do molecular dynamics. We're talking tens of hundreds of millions of dollars he's pumped into this project. And it's insane because it's a chip dedicated purely for molecular dynamics. Why? Because this graph, if you can see it <laughs> adequately, shows that it can do two orders of magnitude better than the best supercomputer at molecular dynamics. 
We all know folding at home and the ability to show folding proteins or chemical environments becomes an important element in simulation in order predicting what drugs are going to work next. The fact that these guys have been able to build this chip outside of uh, the big major companies in this space, and they're only building it for themselves, um, is, is testament to what having a dedicated team with a dedicated idea can be and how powerful an ASIC can be, especially um, in, the machine, in, in molecular dynamics and we'll see in machine learning. So that's legacy hardware that everybody kind of now loves. I, I kind of want to look back on some stuff that we also are kind of familiar with that are seeing a resurgence in terms of the old and new paradigms. Now, analog, analog computing, uh, digital is constrained by what we can represent. Analog can theoretically represent every data, so we're seeing a resurgence in analog computing because now we have the technology to do it at lower power and um, essentially have scaling and manufacturing consistency. The ability to multiply numbers and then use your analog to digital conversion, that's kind of where the conversion accuracy, accuracy lies, but it's super low power, super low latency as well, and you can have any value possible. The problem is still manufacturing and scaling, getting these things to work accurately, um, but as I think Sally will go through a little bit later, there are companies actually making this commercial uh, in terms of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of units. And companies that are doing this, um, Mythic AI, you may have heard, is the one company that kind of died in AI, but then got resurrected by an injection of funding. IBM's doing some work, and then, yeah, Sally will cover Aspinity later. And neuromorphic computing is, 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 is as older than me. Um, however, I really hate the fact that I have a bone to pick with companies who say they are brain-inspired and they're doing neuromorphic. No, you're not. Every chip is brain-inspired because a brain thought about it. <laughs> Um, but in terms of neuromorphic, I usually consider it as spiking neural network, particularly uh, analog, but also digital. The fact that you can have your compute based in the time domain. And spiking neural networks in terms of machine learning are kind of a class of their own. This is why there aren't so many players uh, necessarily doing it in terms of what I consider traditional neuromorphic. But Intel uh, is kind of leading this charge with their research chip, the Luigi 2. Unfortunately, it's hard to get hold of because it is just a research chip. It's part of Intel Labs right now. It's not commercialized. But it is using their latest Intel 4 uh, manufacturing and was actually used as a test chip to bring up the yield. Uh, Spinnaker is, is the other one a lot of people know about. Spinnaker's been around for 10, 20 years based in Manchester. Kind of, I think they're on Spinnaker too. But the idea is you have millions, billions, uh, if not trillions of neurons. Intel's chip is interesting because it's actually a digital design that does neuromorphic but it's essentially infinitely scalable. You just have 1,000 to 10,000 network chips together, and it all acts as one. So if you ever see presentations with this in, it will usually compare it to a mouse or to a human of just how many neurons and synapses there are. And this is a second generation product, and the whole family of products is all using Hawaiian names that I can't pronounce. Quantum computing, uh, the technology that will be ready in 10 years and then commercial in another 10 years. As an analyst now, I have a number of clients who are interested in quantum computing, a big one with IBM. Uh, the one here at the top left uh, going quantum with IBM is a video I did with them, uh, which is about half a million views right now. Uh, we actually timed it just right to go with the Nobel Prize, went to quantum computing last year. Uh, but the big question I get with quantum computing is what is it going to be used for? It's still very esoteric in what people think as traditional compute. There are three answers to that. One, the physical world, phys physics, chemistry, biology. Two is the one that most people talk about, things like traveling salesmen and encryption. And the third one is machine learning, because if we don't mention machine learning, then the share price doesn't increase. It does have problems. Uh, actually, my up and down arrows in this presentation have not worked, but on the right-hand side are the problems. It's any other math doesn't really work. People who are trained to run digital compute programs sometimes have a hard grasp of where quantum computing can be used for. But we've got things like quantum Fourier transforms now. Um, and the software is actually taking off and being a lot more accessible. So there is that high barrier to entry. The other problem here is that quantum computing, as most people see it, requires these massive dilution refrigerators. And the qubits are only stable, coherent, for a small amount of time. So how can we use them effectively? As a result, there's a lot of error involved with just the thermal environment that these uh, qubits are in. So you might need a billion qubits. So that's about 10,000 physical qubits for one logical qubit. And there are more than a dozen players doing this in all different forms, and some of them are actually making money out of it today. There are types of qubits available. Um, I've mentioned you know, a good number of here, iron trap, uh, superconducting, semiconducting. 
uh, nitrogen vacancy centers, I've covered all of these in some form. Uh, the ones I'm most familiar with are the superconducting ones. We're talking 10 millikelvins. Uh, I've got a slide with, with a roadmap uh, showing, but I think the, the important message here from this slide is that bottom line, scalability. If we need a billion qubits, you can't have something that doesn't scale. And right now, the biggest potential scaling is uh, semiconducting because you can build them on a standard CMOS process. However, it's actually superconducting right now that is leading the charge in terms of number of qubits on a single chip. This is a slide from Google because Google's involved in quantum computing, essentially saying that, yeah, the error correction issues in quantum computing are big. You do need 1,000, 10,000 physical qubits per logical qubit. There is a lot of research being done on error correction, um, whereas maybe you don't need so much. But their timeline is that they're looking at an order of magnitude number of qubits increase every three or four years. So in order to get to a quantum supercomputer right at the end, we may be looking at 2040, according to Google's timeline. This is IBM's roadmap. It probably doesn't come out very well in the screen, but the thing I want to point out here is that year on year, they have de a dedicated roadmap for release. More qubits, uh, better software strategy, more integration with academia and business, and they're looking here at the bottom right in how to stitch uh, these quantum chips together so maybe you don't need all the qubits on one chip. They recently just announced their 433 qubit chip, Osprey, and uh, they also just had the title paper in Nature for their 127 qubit chip because they've actually been able to do work that a classical computer can't do. Not Google's nonsense with quantum supremacy where it's just random circuits. This is actual proper physical problem they were able to show was quicker on a quantum computer than a classical or even possible. This is a company I saw uh, a few weeks ago at International Institute of Computing called Quantum Brilliance. Uh, they're playing with room temperature qubits. Now, that's kind of a holy grail. If you don't need to cool it down, you don't need all that helium, you don't need all that infrastructure. They lured me in with this image of a PCIe card. Did they have one? No. This is, this is their goal. Um, they, they run nitrogen vacancy qubits, which are essentially uh, holes built into diamond using nitrogen. Unfortunately, the way of manufacturing them is stochastic. Uh, they have a deterministic way, which they're trying to patent, and they have uh, one chip with two qubits in, with a coherence time of uh, about 100 nanoseconds. So not useful yet, but their goal is to put it into a PCIe card, so a standard server rack just filled with qubit PCIe cards that you can connect together. Um, ISPRA is, solves the scaling problem immediately. I'm only briefly going to cover optical computing here because I know Sally's got a few slides uh, with the companies involved. Um, but what we're dealing here is essentially switches using light in silicon. This is an interferometer. And you split the light, you, do, you change the phase of one of those beams of light, and then they either constructively or destructively interfere at the end of it. I'm a bit skeptical of optical computing because if you have a 2% loss in your constructive interference, you can only go 1,000 gates before you don't have a signal. And in compute, you need more than 1,000 gates to do anything. But there's lots of research being done on adders, multipliers, and how, how you make optical computing work in a, in a more traditional compute infrastructure. Um, the benefit is it's essentially no power. You've got to create the, 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 the light uh, either with an external laser or using some, some funky silicon techniques. And it's speed of light in silicon fast. So we're talking picoseconds here to do your matrix multiply. Unfortunately, it's, it still has a scaling problem. Uh, we're dealing with transistors and digital compute that have been going for 50, optimized for 50 years. Um, so given the fact that this is only just now taking off means it's got quite a way to go. And then ma manufacturing, um, you have to make sure your waveguides are perfect and you have to be able to control them live. And this is what some of the companies like Light Matter and Light Intelligence, which again, uh, I think Sally's got slides on those, um, will cover. This is the light matter chip, and I just wanted to highlight some of the numbers they've put here on the left. 200 picoseconds latency, uh, a 64 by 64 matrix of 8-bit signed operands um, that they've got working. Uh, let, let, let's eliminate the von Neumann bottleneck with optical computing, basically. And then I wanted to speak about low precision because this is kind of what the AI market is, is focusing on right now. Everybody's used to standard FP64, full precision uh, compute. That takes power. If you only need to compute in 8-bit in integer, in integer formats, you can save power. Uh, and if you have the right hardware, you can multiply the amount of compute you need. We're hearing every day that large language models require more and more and more GPUs in order to compute. And part of 
part of what's making it not so exponential growth is the fact that they're able to support lower precision formats. Um, I hope I'm not teaching anybody anything new here, but the way you represent numbers is with bits. You can either do it integer, standard binary, or floating point where it's uh, this multiplier and to the power, they call it the exponent mantissa. What this does is it defines the range and the accuracy. And here's a semi not accurate representation of what the math actually is to get the number. You have a sign bit, you have a mantissa, and you have an exponent. But the whole point is you can define the range and value of numbers. Now, some of these are standardized under IEEE 754, things like double precision, single precision, half precision. Some of the data formats currently being used in AI are not standardized, which means they have different results when you end up clipping numbers, rounding numbers, dealing with infinities and, uh, and, and denormals, and we'll get into that in a bit. But yeah, quantization, you're essentially taking what is a very, you're taking a set of numbers that are able to be represented in one format and essentially trying to reduce that into either rounding or clipping into a data format which can save you power and energy, but you have an algorithm that is resistant to some of these uh, modifications that can still be fuzzy. And uh, AI is very, machine learning is very resistant to being fuzzy. The, I won't go through all of these, but these are all the different quantization formats that I've managed to find online. Uh, some of them, FP6, FP32, FP16 should be uh, instantly recognizable. Uh, BF16 is the brain float 16 format that Google has popularized in machine learning for training. Some of these lower down ones are, are, are mostly being used to inference in machine learning, just doing you know, the quick one-shot uh, results rather than the big training models. And there are uh, some intermediate ones. Some of these are GPU only, for example. And uh, FP2 down here, is, that's what, one and zero? I don't know. Just don't ask me what FP1 is, but research is being done in, in, in all of these. And the reason why I bring it up is because it's not only being used in artificial intelligence, it's also being used in high performance computing. We recently just had international supercomputing uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, these five talks were the main ones on mixed precision because maybe we don't need full double precision everywhere in, in our workflow. If you have, if you're doing aerofoil or you know, molecular dynamics or fluid dynamics, Maybe you need full precision right at the wing, right at the fuselage when you're doing calculations. Maybe you don't need full precision as you're further out and your, um, your simulation can be tolerant to that. You save time, you save money, you save energy. Environment and sustainability goals are very big with companies these days. So if try, trying to find the right software package and the right data representation, HPC is starting to become a thing and it's all leveraging what we're seeing in AI. This is, a, this is a bad slide, um, but it came from ISSCC, again, pointing out the fact that if you have FP64, it requires a lot of energy per operation. If you can do get the same result using a 16-bit float, floating point format or an integer, or eight bit integer format, then you're actually looking at orders of magnitude increase in uh, power efficiency. Now we get onto the AO hardware show. I've taken 30 minutes just to give in the baseline, but the AO hardware show we're gonna talk about AR hardware that's currently in the market today, currently being researched, uh, and there are, again, like I say, a few companies on the show floor here today uh, with their hardware. I started focusing on this because I started, I started noticing the numbers of investment increasing, right? I, I, I kept the number 50 here because I know the real number's over 100, but the market in just hardware alone is more than 10 billion. I think it's actually more approaching 15. And some, some of that is on some of these high-end companies here. There are a number of unicorns um, ignore the fact it says September 2023. You should say September 2022. I did update it in May. Um, but this is accurate as of the end of May. And you probably can't see some of the companies here, but Horizon Robotics at the top, $2.2 billion. That's a Chinese company looking at smart, uh, smart cities. We don't really know much about them, but most of the rest we do. Names that you may have heard of. I've already mentioned Ampere Computing. Um, we'll come up to Cerebrus and GraphCore later. Um, Tens torrent, light, light matter I've already covered, uh, but a few of these are starting to die. A few of these are getting hundreds of millions of dollars of funding every year. It's just the way that the venture capital in this industry works. There will be some consolidation, and we're currently right in the thick of what makes this all exciting, which is kind of why we started doing the AI hardware show to begin with. Um, so we're gonna cover inference and training in two steps. And uh, because I mostly focus on training, I'll let Sally go <laughs> with the inference. Come on, I've spoken enough, your turn. Thank you, have a rest. <laughs>
Okay, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of the inference accelerators that we've got on the market. And I've grouped them into groups. I've got four groups here with different types of architectures. Really what I wanted to illustrate is the variety of different architectures that we've got of novel, cool stuff happening for inference today. Okay, so first up, uh, digital in memory compute. I think probably most people are familiar with this, but really the concept is to uh, take memory and digital compute and mix them together at a very fine level, level of granularity. Um, we obviously want to avoid the von Neumann, von Neumann bottleneck here, so we keep the data and memory very close to the compute, so it's right there when we need it, and we also desperately don't want to be going off chip uh, to a memory to be getting data if we can help it because it wastes energy. Um, so my example here is Accelera. Um, Accelera is a European startup, and they have a brand new chip, which you can see there on the left. Um, it's actually quite a powerful one, 214 tops at int 8, so this is for computer vision, it's for drones, it's for robots, um, it's for other kind of quite meaty computer vision systems. Um, what's impressive about this is the energy efficiency, so 14.7 tops per watt is peak efficiency, and that's actually pretty impressive, kind of market leading figure. Um, you can see, I mean, it's brand new, you can see the demo there on the right, it's not, sorry, it's not a great picture, but I just wanted to show you that it's up and running uh, and it's ready. Uh, here's a little bit about how it works. Uh, on the black picture there, which is the microarchitecture, uh, the green, which is the weight storage, that's the memory, and then you can see the compute part there. It's densely interleaved, so everything's very close together, and they also use pipelining to make sure everything's in the right place at the right time. Uh, I know Ian was talking about mixed precision uh, earlier, so this is a good example of one that used mixed precision, uh, used in eight weights, uh, they have higher precision for accumulation, and they also use FP32 for activations. Overall prediction, accu prediction accuracy is very sensitive to the activation precision. Uh, it's a four-core design, <laughs> and you can see it kind of, uh, it makes sense to make a, a multi-core design, then it makes it much more scalable. You can imagine a two-core or an eight-core version of this further down the line. Um, yeah, the, the accelerator really is a matrix vector multiply accelerator, you can see it there. And the, yeah, the design means basically you can, if you have a small neural network, you can run multiple copies in the different cores or you can cascade them with different neural networks working together. So yeah, very flexible. Uh, here's a little bit about a uh, data center and digital memory compute design. This is from Untether up in Canada. Um, Untether calls its concept at memory compute, but it is digital in memory compute, compute and, and memory mixed together. And um, the idea, same minimize data transfer as much as possible and let's optimize the data flow to make everything run very smoothly and quickly. It's all geared up for energy efficiency. Um, this is actually a really big RISC-V design, 1400 cores in RISC-V. Um, I think the roadmap with, with the energy efficiency that got the roadmap includes uh, down to really small chips in the future. So let's keep an eye open for those. Um, hopefully this diagram comes out. Uh, this is really a close-up of one of Untether's memory banks, and you can see PE here is the processing elements. Each one is a little RISC-V um, with 20 plus custom instructions for AI operations mixed in to this S, big SRAM array. Um, and then they have these uh, really fast communication lanes, east, west, and north, south, to make sure there's absolutely nothing impeding the data flow. They have another horizontal uh, interconnect as well, which is rotating activations between the processing elements, and the idea is basically it saves energy. Um, Untether are one that has invented their own FP8 formats, which is another thing Ian was talking about. Super trendy to invent your own FP8 formats right now for transformer inference, uh, so you can play with yeah, precision versus range. Analog uh, compute and memory. Uh, Ian kind of gave you an overview of how it, how it works. Um, I wanted to give an example here, which is Aspinity, a US startup. Aspinity's concept is, let's do the whole of the signal chain in analog. Let's take the analog signal data, let's do analog feature extraction, then do analog neural network inference, and then let's pass off to something else. The idea is to basically use this ultra, ultra low power chip to separate, separate the always on part of the workload. So this might be listening for a voice, let's say, it's uh, speech recognition or something. Let's try and tell when there's a voice, and then w only when somebody is speaking, let's wake up another chip to actually do the, uh, the speech recognition, something like that. And they, you can see their eval kit there in the middle. So yeah, this is a little bit about how it works. I think you can see kind of top right there, there's a feature extraction block which happens in analog, and then there's neural network inference that happens also in analog. Feature extraction kind of reduces the amount of data that has to go to neural network inference. 
but these, they have these tiny analog cores, which in the center there, you can see the blue squares, they're reconfigurable between the different functions that they have to do. Um, yeah, it uses, I think their secret source is, one of the things is the non-volatile memory cells that they use for, for analog compute, which are geared up for accuracy. But yeah, super cool, kind of within the limitations of what analog com compute can do today. So I know I said inference, but here's a really exciting one, which is analog design for training. Um, so we can't, currently today with deep learning training, we can't do analog uh, training. Uh, it just isn't compatible with backpropagation with the algorithm. So this company, Rain, uh, which is out of Y Combinator here in San Francisco, they work on hardware and software. They develop their own algorithms, training algorithms uh, that can be run in using analog um, hardware. So they're quite an early stage company. This isn't really a product yet. They have a first gen hardware, which is a crossbar array of memristors, uh, quite a normal analog computing setup. What you can see here on this picture actually is a future gen, which is what they've got in mind for what's coming next. This is a re-RAM array, and you can see the, uh, the, tiny, the tiny links. It's like, it's supposed to mimic sparse connections, random connections in the brain, and they actually, it actually, they use that algorithmically to, uh, yeah, it's, it's very cool, it's super cool. It's coming next. <clears throat> This is a paper that um, Rain released uh, at the end of last year. Um, their architecture is called MADE-M, which you can see on the graph is the, the one on the far left. I think they're trying to show not only is analog training absolutely possible, um, this is a proof of concept, but you can see it's orders of magnitude less energy and it's orders of magnitude um, faster overall. So yeah, very promising, very exciting work. Optical, again, uh, Ian stole my thunder a little bit uh, on the optical compute. Um, these pictures are from light matter, uh, and I think light matter is a great example. They're the most, they're probably the furthest advanced in terms of productization um, today. I think Ian spoke a little bit about how the chip works, but they have also this for you box uh, with 16 chips in today that you can buy and put it in your racks. Uh, because it's solo power, you can basically fill the racks up with them. It doesn't hit the, the rack power limit, so you can cram it into the data center very densely. Um, yes, and this is all available today. Yeah, same, same diagram here. Um, this is the, the Max Ender interferometer that they use. Um, Light Matters version of this uses MEMS, basically. Uh, they, what they need to do is change the phase of light going through the wires, so they use MEMS to physically distort the wires, and it changes the refractive index of the, of the wire, which is, yeah, very cool. It's amazing that this works, and it really does work. Uh, I have a slide here on uh, light matters competitor light intelligence. Um, this is actually a demonstrator called Pace. Uh, this demonstrator about 18 months ago, and I'm hoping to uh, to see some new hardware from them coming up pretty soon. Uh, they haven't demonstrated uh, AI on this yet. They're demonstrating something called the Ising problem, which is more like an HPC problem. But yeah, it's the same kind of thing, big matrix multiply accelerator, but their version of the interferometer um, is electrical only. They inject electrons into the waveguide to change the refractive index of the light. So yeah, it's slightly different to the light matter design. And they have the, both companies have the same kind of assembly and manufacturing challenge. It is, it is a, a complex electro and optical system and the chips are stacked together. So there are some challenges there to still to be overcome, I think. Okay, spiking. Spiking is super fun. Uh, it's completely separate to deep learning. Uh, the algorithms are totally different and the hardware is completely different. Um, it's brain inspired uh, compute and generally it's the really tiny accelerators that we're gonna find at the center edge. Um, I wanted to show an example of a digital one here. This one is from Syncense, uh, start about Switzerland. So they have a, a first gen core um, digital spiking accelerator which they have in, as part of this spec module which is a camera module using an event based sensor um, Event-based sensor basically means it looks at the things in the, the pixels in the, the image that are changing and it's a way of kind of extracting information from the scene at very low bandwidth. Um, so there's less data needs to be processed. Um, but yeah, the, what I wanted to show in the middle here is this toy. This is the first commercial application for Syncense uh, for this spec uh, module. It's a, yeah, it's a Chinese consumer electronics company and the, the robot does gesture recognition. Uh, when you play with it, you do the gestures and it copies your gestures. And I think the module is uh, eight milliwatts power consumption during the gesture interaction, which is the, the peak. Syntense has a second type of architecture, um, which is geared up for time series data, vibration, sensor data, bio data, um, which is slightly different, which I'll tell you about in a second. That's their board on the right. 
So this is the SynSense neuron um, as it is in the spec module, in the processors in the spec module. Um, yeah, you can see kind of left to right there, spikes come in, which is a one-bit signal multiplied by the weights, and then they basically just get added together in the neuron. Um, and then when it reaches a certain threshold, it fires on, and that goes on to the next neurons in the chain, the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the algorithm. This is quite a basic, quite a simple version of the neuron, and they actually said they were surprised that this simple version worked perfectly well enough for the, uh, the application they had in mind with the computer vision. Um, but for the Xylo, uh, the, uh, the more like the sensor version, uh, the neuron is a more complicated version, uh, more like a leaky integrating fire where there are temporal dynamics in the neuron. So it kind of, yeah, it kind of <laughs> leaks uh, a little bit. So it's, the way the neuron works is a little bit different. Uh, here's an example of a, an analog spiking neural network accelerator, which I think is probably the only one that fits Ian's very strict definition of neuromorphic. Um, this one is out of Inetera. Inetera, a startup in Europe, they're actually in the Netherlands. Um, but yeah, the diagram is supposed to show the neurons firing, the dots of the neurons firing, and then when you see clusters of dots together, that's the signal, um, that, that's the correlation between the data when the neurons fire. And you can see a different uh, signal to noise ratios there. Yeah, uh, so this is, so the analog part is the blue squares, uh, the compute is the analog part in the middle, and you can see it's surrounded by some, some digital stuff, so it really is a mixed signal design, even though the compute is all done in analog. Um, you can see on the right there, so it's not a great diagram, but the black bars are supposed to re represent spikes going in. Uh, it's multiplied uh, by these synapses, the weights are in the synapses, and then, yeah, spiking neurons are at the bottom, and spikes go on to the next core, to the next part of the design. Um, yeah, I hope, I hope you got a good idea about some of the variety of different novel things we're seeing for inference today. Thanks very much. Ian? So on the training side, there's going to be a few big companies mentioned here. Let, let's start with one of the biggest, Google, with their tense processing unit. Um, I've put V2 here. This is their second generation chip. They actually announced their fourth generation chip last year. Google has a tendency to only talk about a chip after it's been used for two years. So there's probably V5 and V6 uh, already internally being used. But I want to show you this because it actually gives a good example of what their architecture looks like. Uh, they, their, their architecture is based on big matrix multiply units. It, uh, in this case, in this diagram, you see 128 by 128. I know their first generation are 256 by 256. And when you have large training data sets, the size of your matrix multiply engine matters because that's how you can extract additional efficiency. If your matrix multiply unit is too big, you actually lose when you're dealing with data sets that are smaller than that matrix unit. Too small, you have additional overhead of making sure all the matrix, uh, matrix units are fed with the right data. So th th they decided this was the best optimization point uh, for Google's internal workloads, and they paired it with high bandwidth memory because training needs lots of high bandwidth memory. Um, this is you know, an example of uh, just four, four, on a, four on a block. They do uh, conform a lot to the OCP spec uh, in terms of server design. The whole point here is you can network these chips together massively. This is their TPU v2 pod, which is 64 TPUs, petaflops, petaops. That's an argument point, for, I think, for another day. Um, but we're talking about terabytes of memory. Their fourth generation, you can actually get in a pod with 4,096 chips. So we're talking about exaops of compute for machine learning with petabytes of HBM. And uh, the reason they've gone down this road to having their own dedicated ASIC because GPUs are just too expensive. One of the big um, unicorns that you saw on that list uh, earlier is Samba Nova. And this is their chip, the Cardinal. This picture on the left here is Sally's hand. Um, it's much more, you know, better manicured than mine at least anyway, but th their chip is massive and I, I wanted to put this company here not only because they've raised a lot of money, is because their architecture is perhaps a lot more familiar to this audience. They use a coarse-grained reconfigurable array, which essentially is an FPGA for AI. Their architecture is essentially a block of units that they can dedicate to either memory or compute or memory and compute, and the whole point is you can reuse your data in a very cyclical format so you're not moving data everywhere and you're saving the additional power. It may look like your utilization isn't very high, but it allows you to cascade lots of, um, lo lots of machine learning networks all in the same chip. And Sam and Nova's big customers right now are Defense. Defense loves FPGAs, so an FPGA like AI Accelerator seems to be going very well. 
This is an example of the CGRA um, architecture that's very simplified. Point is here you have lots of units that you can configure to uh, do one thing or the other thing, um, or both or neither, and optimize for data flow. They actually call their, uh, Sam and Ova call their chip the reconfigurable data flow unit um, for that reason. Uh, this diagram I thought was great because it just shows you where CGRA is in the whole land of CPU, GPU, ASIC. Um, where it's considered to be, where it's expected to be uh, applicable into the market space. So it's got a very quite, quite a wide remit. This is 2019, so obviously machine learning has come very far since then. Um, I perhaps should reach out for an updated graph. Uh, this is Sam and Ova's architecture, again, just showing all the different units. You can have memory units, compute units, extensive networking on-chip with on-chip switches. This, this architecture is probably about three years old now. We're, we're due a second run for it. Um, one of the things with these startups is you have to wonder when the next generation is coming. Not many talk about a roadmap, uh, and that's because that's usually funding related. But this showcases uh, Sam and Nova, uh, you know, on the chip, you can have your compute, then you go into a memory unit, then you go into a ReLU or a MinMax or any sort of different AI function you can configure. And then you can mani the compiler can manipulate the data to stay in the same area if you need to do uh, compute more times. And then networking chips together. Uh, Sam and Ova will sell you a quarter rack. That's their minimum sales unit. Sam and Ova have actually been paired with AI with uh, supercomputers. So that Fugaku ARM uh, chip that I mentioned uh, in, in the Fugaku supercomputer, Sam and Ova now actually has some of their chips paired with that supercomputer. Why? Because if you've got a massive HPC problem, you, usually you're iterating over a large search space. If you could have the right machine learning model to reduce that search space, you're using less compute, you're using less power, you're saving money, and you're getting to your result quicker. And we're starting to see some of these AI companies uh, being paired with supercomputers in order to help accelerate some of that research. The only issue now is teaching the researchers how to use the AI chips, which is more difficult than you think. This is the biggest chip in the world. This is the Cerebrus wafer scale engine. It's called wafer scale because it's the maximum sized chip you can make out of a wafer. Uh, 46,000 square millimeters. And you're thinking, how the hell do they do that? Well, it's custom IP, yes. You do have the reticle limit. What they've been able to do is stitch together between reticles. So now you have a chip with uh, gigabytes of onboard memory of onboard SRAM, 850,000 AI cores. It does take 24 kilowatts, though. So that custom cooling has also been had to be designed in order to make this to work. But it really is this big. Uh, the marketing material they usually put is a dinner plate. I usually like to show a picture of me trying to take a bite. Um, but yeah, if you hear Intel talk about having a one trillion transistor chip by 2030, I keep telling them it's already here. I'm not sure they believe me, but it does exist. Um, they are a company with hundreds of millions of dollars of funding, so they are one of these unicorns. You have to question how much one of these costs and what they need to do to essentially uh, stay in the black. And we'll get to that in a second, but one question you might be asking is yield. You can't design a big chip like that without defects. Now, TSMC 7 nanometer defect rate for a wafer is actually about 50 defects per wafer. Their architecture is designed that if there's a dead core, they can just route around it. So their effective yield is 100%. Who else can say that? Now, in terms of how much we estimate the cost to be, Pittsburgh Supercomputer has purchased a couple of these, and they had a grant of $5 million to do it. So two and a half million a piece. And that was for the first gen. There's a second gen. So that probably requires arm, leg, and firstborn as well. Um, reach out to Andrew Feldman if you want one. But they're paired with a supercomputing center as well, just kind of like uh, Sam Bonova were, except this chip is being used differently. It's not being used to reduce search bases. It's actually being used for high performance compute. Because it has this big 800,000 core array, it's being used for stencil compute, which is a big part of HPC. And because it manages to keep so much data on the chip, you can actually do good simulation with it. And ultimately, uh, from a general perspective, I think the AI chip companies that are going to succeed in the training space are ones that have multiple uses. You can't just be a one-trick pony anymore. So having access, essentially being useful for HPC crowds along with general machine learning crowds is going to be a feather in these guys' cap. Here's an example of the simulation that they did with the DOE in terms of stencil compute. 
this is just you know, th thermal movement and propagation between a hot plate and a cold plate. But they were able to do 200 million cells in real time. Uh, for, there is an animation online. I didn't put it in here because I had to give a PDF. But the core design is fun because you have 850,000 cores, but half the core is SRAM. Four, 48 kilobytes of SRAM, that's how you get up to the uh, gigabytes of total uh, data on the chip. With so many cores, even with 24 kilowatts, you're limited to 30 milliwatts power per core, running about 1.1 gigahertz, which is you know, a good frequency for optimized TSMC 7 nanometer. Um, they are working on future generations, I am told. Uh, I'm not told how much they cost. The other big wafer scale player is Tesla. Now, Tesla self-driving, yeah, they have a lot of machine learning workloads. And Elon has said, if we keep our GPU cluster running, it will no longer be profitable for self-driving. So they decided to build their own chip. What the chip is, the D1, is a standard 650 square millimeter die, but they put 25 of these on a wafer-sized interposer. S somewhat active interposer, it's mostly for data transfer, but the whole point is, again, like the Cerebus, you just have access to so much compute, so much data, without having to pay the penalty of taking your data off to HBM or off to a, a big centralized server. The dojo on the left, I was lucky to actually be at AI, AI day and I held one of these things, including the cooling, it's 22 kilos or 46 pounds in American. Um, but the supercomputer itself is 120 of these tiles. And Elon has said he wants seven of these up and running by the end of the year. Lots of really cool technology. I could spend an hour talking about this. Uh, but the, the, the matrix is interesting because not only have they developed AI silicon, they had to develop five other pieces of silicon just to get this thing to work. You have your tile, you have your standard chip, then you have the wafer carrier. They created their own custom interface silicon because you need to be able to feed the beast. A lot of these big compute problems, it's all about feeding the beast. You'll see here that the matrix is actually three tiles wide and then goes down. So out of those 120 tile supercomputers, it's three wide and 40 long. The reason why, it's the edges that supply the data into, in, into this training matrix, into the supercomputer. And you can only get data into the center tile at a certain speed. So that's your limitation on how you, make, how you design um, the massive amount of compute. And then there's custom switch silicon, custom networking silicon for the back-end computers. It's, it has to work um, in order for Elon to uh, envisage his real goals. Um, they, they, they're really smart people at Tesla. It's not just Elon, and um, I really wish they'd talk more about it. So if you know anybody in there, please you know, pass on my regards. But this is their big die. It kind of looks like a, a little bit like a Cerebrus core. Most of it is SRAM. Um, each one of these cores actually runs four threads, and two of them are just dealing with data movement because just how you have to move the data around in some of these big chips. Focusing on mixed precision compute, again, they run their own custom floating point eight formats. Um, Elon has said that he, want, he will at some point make this technology available external to Tesla, um, though this first generation has some limitations where it can't do that. Now, one company that is, has raised million, hundreds of millions of dollars of funding, but is kind of um, on its death knell is Graphcore. Uh, some of their funders have actually written off all their investment, uh, which is a shame because as a Brit, I have to have passion in British companies, and Graphcore is British. But they were one of the first people onto the market with AI Silicon. Uh, they had big partnerships with Dell and Microsoft planned. Unfortunately, transformer networks came along, these big, large language models. And the hardware really isn't built to do that. It's great for computer vision, but LLMs just, it's not really a, not really a go for their product right now. And instead of doing a new generation product, they actually worked on wafer and wafer bonding. Um, which is actually really interesting as a technology. What they did is they put the deep tension capacitors on a separate wafer, and they did wafer-to-wafer -wafer bonding um, for their chip. As a result, they could lower the voltage, increase efficiency, or get 40% more performance. And they're supposedly selling this at the same price. And they do want to sell you a good computer. That's good, named after Jack Good. I really want to actually make a video called Who Wants a Good Computer? Uh, but the whole point here is 8,000 of their chips, you can get 10 exa ops of uh, AI, FP16 performance. The idea being that you can address perhaps some of these large trillion parameter models. Um, the only thing is you do have to use their software, which has taken five years to get version 1.0. Uh, 
uh, but they'll sell you this uh, $120 million slash configuration dependent. Now, Tens Torrent, I hope this guy is known to everybody. This is Jim Keller. He is what is considered a chip wizard. He uh, helped rebuild AMD's fortunes. He's worked at Intel. He built Tesla's FSD3 chip, um, or FSD chip that's in Hardware 3. Uh, he was with Apple during the A4, A5 iPhone revolution, PSME, DEC. Um, he is a mastermind. I've got plenty of interviews with this guy on my channel, and Sally does as well. However, he's now involved in AI startups, and he's the CEO of this company called Tense Torrent. Actually, they're going to hate me because this is their old logo. Uh, but their, their whole point here is they're looking at the scalability of AI as the main problem. How do we solve some of these issues that some of these big models have with GPU to GPU connectivity. The way they're doing that is making, simplifying the software paradigm as well. So one core in one of their chips looks like one chip looks like one supercomputer. So it doesn't matter if you program for a core, that program will work on the supercomputer and scale. Uh, again, one of these companies that have hundreds of millions of dollars of funding. Uh, they've got an office here in Santa Clara, one in Austin, one in Toronto. Uh, this is me with Jim. This is him smiling. If you catch him smiling, good for you. He rarely does it. Uh, but this is uh, their generation two and generation three chips. The first generation was a small dev chip. One of the problems with Tense Torrent is that they have been slow to commercialization, and I think that's actually now going to pure overdrive. They recently announced partnerships with LG. But they're not only designing a core, they're designing IP, and they're designing chiplets. So the whole point of uh, Jim's vision is that to uh, essentially reimagine a DEC uh, to be the powerhouse of design that DEC used to be, but actually do it in a commercially viable way. This is an example of their uh, supercomputer that they're you know, showcasing what their hardware could do. Right now, they're still using Ethernet as their main connectivity chip to chip. So it does mean that if you want to buy a rack, half the cost is in the network cables, not in the silicon. But that will change over time as, as they evolve. They have multiple products in the roadmap. And you probably can't see this. Uh, but on the far left, you see these little Ts. These are their 10.6 cores. They're about four teraflops of performance, of uh, FP16 performance. And they believe that when you compile a machine learning problem into a graph, when you have your graph compiler, the best weight of compute for an individual unit is about four teraflops. This is their second generation, third generation, built on 12 nanometer. They're now moving um, to CSMC for the later generations. But they're going to go into advanced packaging in a big way. So they're doing die to die interconnects. They're looking at uh, chiplets and HBM with this product here on, on, on the right called Grendel. They're also building high performance RISC-V cores. So they've got a 128 core high performance RISC-V server chiplet that they're designing. Again, I have a video on it. It's pretty good. But they hired the guy who essentially was the chief architect for Apple's M1 to do it. So you know it's going to be high performance. Other players in the high performance space uh, for Risk Five, you know, Ventana Micro and Rebos, just to name a couple. Um, everybody's asking, is Risk Five ready for prime time? These guys are trying to show it. So that's kind of the end of uh, the AI hardware show. We are going to take some Q and A. I do want to showcase what the AI hardware show looks like if you've not had a chance to see it yet. Um, Sally and I do a News Twenty Four style covering, you know, six AI companies and chips, and then we have a, a general purpose uh, freeform chat. Again. See on YouTube, we're also on all your major platforms where you, where you get your podcasts. Um, if it doesn't work, please do let me know. And uh, because I'm an influencer, I have to push the merchandise. Um, I love my little logo. That was made by one of my, uh, one, one of my, uh, one of my viewers like six months into my channel. Um, but I've got a special code for DAC if you just want get to a, get a mug or something of a potato eating a wafer, because that's where we are in the industry today. Um, but thank you, and if we've got time, we'll take some questions. So, so what's the challenge for the analog AI? You didn't really mention uh, so what okay. the... Okay. Uh, so the challenges for analog compute, uh, the number one challenge is precision. So usually it's a, an array of memory cells, and then you're running the memory cells kind of sub-threshold. So doing that precisely when the devices are slightly variable, you have this device variability. Um, so yeah, it's all about precision. Usually it's a calibration kind of algorithm of some, of some kind um, that you run in each and every chip. But yeah, there are, there are ways of doing it, but it's still complicated today. It's still, uh, we're still only running kind of int 8 precision on those. Uh, hey, 
Um, so obviously there's a lot of different hardware options out there, but NVIDIA is kind of taking yep. it all right now because of the software. Um, do you see a lot of these software options? Like I saw Databricks, they recently acquired Mosaic, you know, being able to democratize a lot of this AI applications, or do you think it's not really a lot of progress yet? Well, it's, so one of my claims to fame is I did the first ever CUDA course in the UK back in 2009. So NVIDIA did a really good job of embedding themselves in the academic space 15 years ago, and that's propagated to today. They're seeing the benefits of that. Um, one of the advantages AI has in general is that everybody builds to frameworks now, whether that's TensorFlow, PyTorch, CAFE. You kind of don't need to worry about the underlying compiler so much, whereas with CUDA, obviously, you're thinking about the whole entire chain down, down to the silicon. Um, we're seeing a lot of the companies, a lot of the big companies we've mentioned today, AMD, Intel, they're looking at CUDA conversion tools, right? Hipify and uh, Sickle, convert Hip Sickle, and uh, yeah, too many acronyms, but. Uh, and you know, th th there's a middle amount of success. You, you mentioned Mosaic ML, they just recently announced that they were able to do a conversion um, to using AMD silicon with a, you know, a near perfect CUDA to AMD conversion. The question is how, how relevant do those tools propagate? A lot of people in this space, um, and I, I, I speak to VC funders you know, all the time and investors on Wall Street about this, they do say what's gonna dislodge Nvidia because they have such a, strong hon st such a stronghold. The only other architecture that has so many engineers optimized for is x86. <laughs> but nobody builds an x86 AI chip. However, Intel x86 is strong in inference today. And people do just buy the thing that works rather than the thing that may end up better TCO after six months optimization. Um, yeah, the one thing that could dislodge CUDA is just everybody optimizing for frameworks and, and that's just it. Or it's all abstracted in the cloud, which is depending on who you speak to, a good or a bad idea, depending on your data integrity. Um, it's, it's tough to say because Intel and AMD are big companies with lots of product lines. NVIDIA just does GPU. So all their R&D is gonna go funneling down that. And these companies are more software engineers than hardware engineers these days. The only way a lot of the, a lot of the startups are gonna compete is by just optimizing for the framework and finding that those one or two customers, perhaps in HPC, um, that are willing to put in that work. So. Okay, thanks. So at what point, looking forward into the future, there's a lot of competition right now in building these accelerators and you know, the hardware. When do you see some clear winners? You know, right now there's a lot of startups. Uh, there's obviously big players, small players, wafer scale. Yeah. When do you see a settling time? Uh, when do you think the new Google or Microsoft of uh, AI will become uh, very prominent? Well, so we thought that was kind of happening last year, right? We had a big eight month period where there was no new VC funding for any major AI company. And then Mythic died. And then Mythic kind of resurrected. We've just seen Lightmatter get another 150 million. Ampere Computing have just had hundreds of millions injected into them. Um, so the investment cycle is starting up again. Which, mean, which means that some of these companies are gonna be kept on a lifeline perhaps longer than they should. Um, I, I think, as I said earlier, the chips that have multiple uses at the end of the day are the ones that are gonna win out because they can appeal to a wider audience. Uh, the ones that are one-trick ponies end up with a smaller customer base than perhaps they were envisioning. Uh, one, of the ch one of the chips we didn't mention but was on the list was called Grok. Um, Grok has a really interesting chip because that chip is optimized for batch one inference, but it's um, deterministic. So you know how long it's gonna take to run an inference regardless of what the data is, uh, which is a really neat and innovative de design. And they're gonna fi find customers who really, really want that. But that shouldn't be the be all and end all for that company. They're actually due a second generation, so we're waiting to hear. Um, and that's actually, that's actually built by John Ross and team, and he used to be Google. Sorry, Google yeah. TPU, yeah. I think we're gonna go have drinks with one of the engineers tomorrow. Yes. So we'll find out we'll more. We'll find out some more. Well, if that's all, thank you all thank for you watching. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, please watch the show.